Here we go. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that great? We can see. Wonderful, Jan. We can see humans. <laughs> yes. Well, I was just explaining to Cease that we, we make a live Zoom so we can actually see faces instead of, you know, talking to yourself to this blank screen with a thousand people you can't see. It's very weird. <laughs> It's like yes, it is. you can you you can get used to it, but it's weird, right? Yes, it's not fun. No, humans are better. <laughs> and you would miss your favorite part anyway, which is seeing all the faces. That's right, right. Robert. Where That's are right. you? That's one um, thing right next to you in my screen, but oh, here you I'm are. probably on the third screen someplace. No, I'll be quiet for a while. <laughs> <laughs> for a while. <laughs> Not for long, I'll bet. This is my favorite part, though. I like going through the screens and seeing mm -hmm. everything that's here because we get to know each other in, in the community, which is really great. Mm -hmm. So today we have Cease Sykes with us. And I'm really, I, I already feel like I know you. <laughs> it's a bit funny, but we have a shared friend in common, Mark Lewis, who a lot of you will know because um, we've had him here in the uh, Embody Dialogue series. And Mark uh, lives in Toronto. So we see each other and we're friends. It's very nice. And um, also your friend Cease too, right? You know Mark quite well. I do, I do. <clears throat> Met him a few years ago and just stayed in contact, you know, just so much to share around. Yeah, yeah. And such a beautiful learning model of addiction, which is so compatible with this depathologizing model that Absolutely. we've been talking about, right? That in Absolutely. polyvagal theory, we really welcome all the wonders of the body in different parts, right? And how bodies are designed to help us to survive. So let's start with a short little coming into the body, because this is the body dialogues, right? So I want to take a moment to just settle yourself in your chair, or you might want to stand up, or you might want to lie down. Just check and see what your body says. How would your body like to be accompanied right in this moment? And then just pausing and slowing everything down. Just noticing what wants my attention in here, inside. And I have to go because everybody's lying in now. Can you uh, mute people, Michelle? Yeah. Just coming back somewhere down into the center of your body. I remember Jean Genlin using this image as we go inside of leaves gently falling off the tree. So our attention gently falling somewhere down into the center. And then saying hello to this inside you. And then just notice if there's a part of you in there that's saying hello, calling out for some attention. And notice how your body carries this part. Maybe noticing what nervous system state you're in. Maybe there's the beginnings of a felt sense forming inside with this part of you. And then just letting all of the parts know that we're going to 
share in a wonderful dialogue with C sites about internal family systems. And this is a body friendly zone. Space of really welcoming what's happening inside for you. And keep feeling your feet coming back to the floor and your awareness back to the ground. Hmm. You've got something curious in there that you want to find out more about. That was lovely, Jan. Thank you. So I'm going to spotlight with you for the first little bit, and then we'll come back to the big group and do um, questions and answers and explorations. Okay, so... I'm going to spotlight you and me. And here we are. Beautiful. Yeah. So we were talking before we started a little bit about um, how we got started in this business, because I think we've probably both been at it for quite a long time now. <laughs> Many decades. Many it's decades. Not the years adding up, it's the decades. <laughs> So you had were, were saying that you had been in, you were born in Chicago, is that right? I was born, raised, spent virtually all my life here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're there now still. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Okay. So tell me, like, how did you? How do you think this? Where you are today? Mm -hmm. And just having written a book too, right, about IFS and addiction. Yeah. What is kind of the thread, or do you have a sense of what goes back in your own history that brings you to where you are right now? Oh, that's such a good question. I, I, hopefully, I won't give you too long of an answer, Jan. <laughs> um, well, I just think, you know, uh, you know, I was born in this big Irish Catholic family. I was the oldest. My mom was depressed. My dad didn't know how to deal with her. She was loud. She was also rage filled, you know, and I was parentified. You know, I was very close to her, you know, would come home from school and sit on the bed next to her when she would be in the bed and just talk to her when I came home from school. So I just took on this role, right? You know, developed it, you know, when, when I was very, very young. And like what I say when I'm starting my trainings is that we call uh, using parts or addictive behavior parts, compulsive parts, firefighters or soothers in our model. And I say my whole family is filled with firefighters, not all of my, my all of my family of origin, but I don't have to go too far out in the generation. So, you know, alcohol use, drug use, gambling, suicide, sexual abuse, incest, this is all there. So this was in my family growing up when I, I got married young, right out of college. I married into a family without telling my husband's story that had some similar kinds of issues. So I would say for my whole life, I've been sort of metabolizing yeah. Um, different kinds of addictive issues. My mom's issues with food, with rage, with smoking, nicotine, all of that. Um, her Both her brothers died of alcoholism. So, you know, these are all things that were in my family. So when I, I wanted to be a social worker when I was in high school, I thought that, you know, that's, so again, this has just been so much a part of my personality to try to do something, I think, with what was right in front of me. And um, I originally was a family therapist. And I loved that. I loved learning about my, you know, my role in my family it was so gratifying, so healing to my system to learn about the different roles and about the parents in conflict. And when parents are in conflict, the kids suffer. They're either neglected or blamed or both, right? That sort of systemic principle. And yeah. that just resonated so much with my own family life and with my understanding. And then I was working with an organization that did all kinds of work with physical and sexual abuse. I just dove into the deep end right when I um, started my work and working with women and men who'd, ex who'd survived in the 80s, right? Survivors. Yeah. Was oh, the survivors. Yeah. Didn't yeah. even use the word trauma so much. It was survivors, though, as opposed to victims, you know, yeah. it was that yeah. renaming. Yeah. Um, and they taught me how to be therapists. Mm -hmm. They knew, and I fascinated if I was in a part. 
are you tired? Why are you late? We started five minutes late. I've been waiting for you, you know, all those parts. You know, are you paying attention? I don't like how you said that. You know, they call me on my parts or my judgment or my impatience or my confusion. So, and, and really just, I had to dig deep as a clinician to really be with them and what they were saying to me. It, it forced me to dig deep, to connect to my own vulnerability um, and not be, and you know, the stone center, you wrote something about this feminist. Yes, yeah, the stone, stone center, center. The early feminist therapists. They you were got very it. Tough. I yeah. still remember the newsletter they had. I don't know if you remember this yet, but they had a newsletter. I remember reading about just just lowering that the field, the upper lower, you know, you know, authority versus I know versus you know, and the relation. Co regulate the beautiful and, co regulation, right? Yeah, right. We just, now we have words for this, right? At yes, the time, yes. that you know, don't go one up. You know, we're yeah. we're yeah. all in the same plane. So all these things impacted me too, and. I feel like I, I I had to do that to be with it. So I'm doing this for many, many years. And then I find out in a conversation with my mom after she had spent the weekend watching John Bradshaw on TV, if you remember him, <laughs> yes. as I say, he was Irish, a former Jesuit priest, you know, a Texan, you know, he had all these extreme personality. My mother could learn from him. She could relate. Well, she watched, she can't even want to see her. She goes, I watched him all weekend. You know, I never got out of my chair. I'm like, what? Do you ever heard of him? Yeah, I go, mom. So out of that conversation, she tells me about her childhood abuse, mm. about the incest going up in her family. No, I said, mom, have you ever told anyone before? No. Mm. Not, one person, not one person. I go, did you tell dad? She goes, no. I go, you have to tell him now, mom. She goes, why? <laughs> what will he say? I said, could you tell me, mom? You know, I knew enough to get out of the role. Um, but just... Everything made so much sense to me. I hear I was, I've been working for over 10, 12 years with, you know, uh, sexual abuse cases in families and having no conscious idea that this was in my own family. Your own family, yeah. So this was very powerful in my system and such a healing to understand my mom in this deeper way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so sometime later when I got involved with IFS, so um, you, you met Dick Schwartz way back when, is that right? I met him way back when, back in the 80s, you know. Right, because so he before, was also a family therapist. Yeah, we were all in Chicago and there was a little family therapy community. And one day we said, Dick has a new idea. <laughs> so <laughs> downtown, I hear Dick's new idea. And we, you know, he's working with disordered eating. We think, oh, it's going to be something about, you know, bulimia or something. So um, <clears throat> what ended up happening was he's standing in front of a blackboard and with the pie chart, and he starts saying, I'm actually helping my clients focus internally on their inner system. And we're like, this is, you know, completely contradictory to family systems thinking, which is if you change the context, yes. you change the visuals role, you change, you know, interactions. And that was beautiful work with all these, you know, abuse impacted families. But there was a piece where we still did individual work with, you know, the women survivors. We always did that. So sure. he took it to another level and we were just kind of blown away. But at the time, Jan, I really thought, hmm, is it, does it need to be this complicated? You know, mm -hmm. and he just, he didn't have a system yet. He just had parts, right? Um, but a, man, a number of years later, I saw him again. I said, I'm going to go see what Dick has to say. And I loved it. And as I like to say, it's because the model had improved. <laughs> I, and it had, he had gotten more cleared about the systems and so forth and the self. But at the same time, I had gone through a lot of soul searching in my life, troubles in my marriage, real, you know, all my codependency with my mom, but he just really done some of that work. So I think I was ready to sit with more of the, my own vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's a process, talk about developmental process as a clinician. Um, I loved family systems, but I, I needed more. I needed more too, you know? So I think uh, this model then, I was open to sort of searching my own, you know, even more deeply. And also having a way to, the last thing I'll say is one of the categories of IVS, we call them firefighters, they put out the fires of shame, but those are the parts that, that soothe yeah, as opposed to manage our lives. And we think of those parts and put those parts out the same way as, as Parts that are, they're adaptive. 
They are engaged in this behavior in order to solve a problem. They are not the problem. The problem being, you know, uh, trauma, attachment wounds, alienation. So yeah. emotional vulnerability that 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 person has had no way to handle. Yeah. So when I saw that, and I it just sort of thought about all the people I loved and still love, some of whom still suffer and have suffered and generations of suffering around addictive use and to yeah. see that as a way to cope. So for me, for all of us out there, you know, in this audience, we can say, oh my God, and people say this to me all the time. I got addicts everywhere in my family, just one alcoholic after another, and these eating disorders. I say, I got it. And what if I were to say to you, I got trauma all over my family. I got people trying to cope with trauma all the way through and attachment wounds and loss. What if, what if we say it that way? So what if both are true, you know, and what's that connection? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is, I think, what my long answer to <laughs> your short question. It all comes together for me. <laughs> yeah, and what I love is that you're, in many ways, I really relate to your story and, and how mm -hmm. you're really bringing your own journey into the work and how we both learned early on from uh, sexual abuse survivors and incest survivors, because yes. when you go to that extreme of yes. suffering, right? That's right. Especially incest survivors. That was the first yeah. group I ever did. Yeah, me you too. too. You too. And me too. There's a lot of us that I think started that way, especially as social workers. I think that's right. And, yeah, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it really just shows you so much about human behavior, right? Yeah. Because you're out at the extremes of that in terms of both perpetrators and survivors. Absolutely. And yeah. how they, in those extreme places, people have, so many dissociated parts mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it gets really complex right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but also and i'm sure you know and i first thing that you would call it the self but also that sense of that inner voice that inner knowing so much if i keep listening they knew so much about how they needed to heal. We did talk about the inner child in the 80s, right? Yeah, yeah. So there was something around that, but just sort of intuitively, so many of these women knew that they were essentially parts of themselves that they needed to sort of bring home, you know, and we needed to bring in. And, um, and I think when we, yeah, very, and when we go into then into real embodiment and we realize mm -hmm. this is what I learned with Jemlin was like the body knows yeah to just give it what it needs and mm. what it needs often is for us not to talk so much right. but to inv as therapists but to invite the space the opening the pausing mm. the body to come forward right right yeah it's that that the <clears throat> pause breathe notice that's what I say pause breathe notice um and just the sense also of um I guess the healing of patience, you know, and optimism, like I just, yeah. my faith, I mean, I, I learned that it doesn't matter what you've been through in a sense. I mean, ultimately people heal from all kinds of things. The desire for healing is also inside the desire for wholeness. So I can respect that and not have be afraid because someone has this terrible history as a clinician, right? Oh, yeah, I'm sure you're the same. We don't enter it with fear. Oh my gosh. Or what are we going to do about this? No, we, we have, this welcome. Yeah, we have this real inner belief that mm -hmm. body will seek. And this this was so mm -hmm. clear in Jenlin's work and also with Steve mm -hmm. Borges. There's mm -hmm. this, you know, inner direction, this this mm -hmm. central state of health and growth and restoration. And it's there, you know, it's hard, it's sometimes a little flame. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we believe in it uh -huh. in the we it's like a it's kind of a faith in it right it's like we believe that that's how bodies are designed mm -hmm. that's right that's right and i think that you know prior to maybe this century if you will um spiritual practices talked about that better than psychological practices yes very much you know, so but it's better spoken about in our in our community now yeah um, and the different ways of speaking, we might call it the self energy, the spark of self yeah, that's, you know, yeah, that's available yeah. in moments in the beginning, but yeah. still there. And we're always listening for that. 
Yeah. You know, <clears throat> even I uh, would think I was sharing with you before that the way I learned about parts originally mm. was in terms of multiple personality, what we what I call adaptation, which was called and is called right dissociative identity disorder. Right. And yeah. again, shifting that paradigm into seeing it as an adaptation. And even that was Frank yeah. Putnam's work back in the 80s. And mm -hmm. um, there was lots of folks with very dissociated multiple parts, right? Yes. And he called that the ish, the inner self helper, which I really like. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. And he would talk about that, that even in like the worst situations of ritual abuse, where you'd mm -hmm. see a lot of yes. yes, there would be this little flame you could blow on you know mm -hmm. and i think that really gives us a special way of being with people doesn't it i think it does and i think to accept that in ifs you'd say that that's a basic assumption the belief that everyone has a self or have access to self and mm -hmm. that self is not damaged by experience so much the sense of feeling damaged or feeling broken <clears throat> is so common in our belief that we've grown up, especially when we've grown up young and uh, with so much to carry. We feel broken or damaged and we say, yes, we, and I you might say there's parts of you yeah. that, that carry the burdens and the damaging and the wounds, but from self, that ability to witness it, to notice it, to just acknowledge it, yeah. uh, it's still in there. So I, I love, you know, that what we're doing, it, it, and it just, it opens the door when we're sitting with the client. It's so important in the very beginning to sit with that sense of possibility rather than Absolutely. a sense of fear or even a sense of manager. What am I going to do now? How am I going to help? You know? <laughs> I mean, this is really it, right? Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. quality of presence and believing in the body's restoration, mm -hmm. the body's mm -hmm. capacity and desire it's like steve says you know we're we're we have a biological imperative of connection and co-regulation right that's right hardwired right hardwired I, I love polyvagal theory because you can bring all of these things that we know and we talk about and conceptualize mm -hmm. and you bring them mm -hmm. into the neurophysiology and you go wow that's cool like there's right. this other way of understanding it which which really, I think, um, empowers the model even more so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, Jen, the, the adding the science and neuroscience piece mm -hmm. to our field has just, it's sort of um, for all of us, and it's really everyone, it gives that, that reason why, you know, it just sort of backs up what we're doing, which I think is also really, really powerful. So it's actually, in a way, amazing how much our field has changed in this century, I would say. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I guess, and in IFS, I guess I would say what we are is a relationship building model. Yeah. So the way we're doing that is calling these different active, but we, you know, we focus, we were talking about this in our, in our pre-chat. Yeah. Uh, that early on when Dick was developing this model, he ran into Ron Kurtz and they became cousins or brothers and really enjoyed him. Ron Kurtz being the person who developed Hakomi. Yeah. So they informed each other. So mm -hmm. one of there's a sort of a series of we call them the six Fs. I think you have six Fs, but they they were relate to a different part of your process. But we to do, which helps people build that internal relationship, um, finding and focusing. And around focusing internally is where do you see that part in or around your body? How do you notice it? So we're looking for activation, body sense, or even a feeling of a weight on my shoulder, or yeah. you know, just. Mm -hmm. a, this negative energy in my ear that I keep hearing. Yeah. So, but that came, that particular question, Dick will acknowledge, came from his collaboration with Ron Kurtz. Right. So <laughs> that sense of the body, we probably are a little, I, I will tell you, people say, you're a little wordier than the body people sees, you know, <laughs> we're a little wordier. Um, but at the same time, that core sense, <laughs> we can find it in and around the body is key. But look at how it goes together. Just in the right. way that we're here right now, co-regulating, there's an excitement, right? right? And that it goes right. together. Yes. Yeah. Ron right. Kurtz was also a, a friend of Jean Jandlin's. Oh, for heaven. I did not know oh, that. They crossed around the felt sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you can Great. see. You know, and I know Dick Schwartz said that he had met Jandlin, actually. 
Yeah, and it's a Chicago connection too. Yeah, University those, of Chicago. That's so right. those wisdom, you know, those wisdom practices coming together, you know. Yeah, and it's reassuring, isn't it? It's like we all it, have these different flavors or pieces that we can add into this integrated model. And the more we have, the more we can find the language that really resonates with the client. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. the more we have to offer. That's right. So shall we go to uh, all our people? We've got um, sure. 92 people here with us, and I think 400 signed up. So people oh, are really curious about this. So I'm going to take us back to the group. Remove the spotlight. And hello, everybody. Boy, that went fast. It was one of the fastest 20 minutes. Okay, so <laughs> that was fast, right? Okay, let's look in the chat and see what questions we have or, or comments. And also, please join us. Feel free to come and ask us questions. Um, somebody, Diane, asked, we just mentioned something about feminism and an approach. Oh, the Stone Center. Right. Uh, yes. The Stone Center doesn't exist anymore, does it? Doesn't it exist anymore. It was out of Cambridge, and I, I'm not sure if it evolved into part of their community or what. But they were women who wrote about the specific role of women and feminism in psychotherapy, sort mm -hmm. of as a sort of a contra narrative to so much about family therapy being written by men, and even looking at the roles in family through the lens of more feminism and the lows, roles of family through patriarchy. Yeah. Um, Judith, what was her name? Blackstone? Um, Judith? Oh my gosh. Jordan? Is that yes. Right? Yes. Oh, good one. Yes. Yeah. Judith. Relational psychotherapy. So how women uh, it, through a feminist lens were really in many ways we were real co-regulators in the system with uh, with also equalizing a lot of the relationships. Yeah. That's right. Looking at your client, and you and I were talking about this, looking at your client as an equal, you know, a collaborator on the process, not as, thank God you have me and I know more than you. And, you know, that yeah. sort of top down hierarchical, yeah. really addressing that directly. Yeah. At the same time, I really like when Dick was here with us, um, I think this was when, it was another time maybe, but he talked about the importance of being a leader. And I really like that too. Yeah, uh, because I think it's very important. I, I seem to be talking about it a lot with students. It's that not to be afraid to also really, I mean, when people come and they're in the depths of trauma, they're lost. Right. They're lost. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, to give some sense of, you know, holding the belief in the body wisdom, but also something to organize conceptually, right? They, they need a sense of being held and contained in a safe way. So I, I love the way he talked about that because I think it's very true. Yeah, I, I think that uh, briefly, yeah, I love that combination of the getting your co-regulating, but being open and especially with addictive processes, there's so much stigma uh, about food issues, substance use issues. It's, in, it's culturally normalized to think of the addict as messed up bad and very one-dimensional yeah. whether it's food substances porn whatever gambling yeah. so to for ifs we say this is multi-dimensional there are many parts involved so for me just when i'm sitting with my client i'm thinking about their how their system is putting together and um, offering that from the beginning that there's a system here there's a plan here what if we get you organized a little bit it all feels chaotic yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that organizing takes a kind of um, a leadership role. In That's some right. Way. At That's some right. times, right? And other times you get out of the way. Right. But yes, we, we it's our responsibility to start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, somebody. Oh, Finn Lilly. Hello, Finn Lilly. Hello. Do you want to ask a question? Come and talk to us. Uh, yeah, sure. I just... Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, CC. It was fantastic hearing uh, everything you guys are sharing. Um, but yeah, the ish sounded fantastic. Um, I'm DID multiple myself. And so trying to square like self versus multiple selves kind of thing, right. and how that kind of works. And so ish really just 
uh, resonated. So I was like, okay, well, it's a part that's helping or a person that's helping, but you know, not having to worry about core and all that. So I was just wondering who coined that again, uh, so that I could look them up. Putnam? Okay. Frank Putnam, who is a psychiatrist. I don't know if he's still alive, um, but he wrote a book called, I think it was just called Multiple Personality Disorder. Okay, but perfect. Really, really, uh, I went to see him years ago, and he, this was back in the days when we were talking a lot about ritual abuse. I don't know, do people even talk about that anymore? You know? Yeah. Or I mean, impact? I mean, what happened to all that work? Like, we need to go back there, Cease. Mm -hmm. yeah I've got multiple clients that deal with that so yeah mm -hmm. definitely yeah, sure this do. trauma is this umbrella word Jan you know and uh and it, and maybe it's all sometimes I almost react to the word trauma it's just so we're fleeing it around at the same time and I don't want to lose the impact of what different people are holding yeah you know thanks mm -hmm. so much Thanks, Jen Lily. So, so Colleen asked, um, can Cease tell us about how internal parts become polarized? Mm, okay. Well, <clears throat> we're always looking for balance. So in the IFS model, we think about, like many models, we have sort of divide the psyche into three parts. We call the managers are all our high functioning parts, but also our evaluative parts. So that includes the critic and judging and perfectionism along in that manager side. And then another <clears throat> part of the system being called firefighters, soothers, distractors. And without any kind of trauma, we would say the work-life balance, right, is about our parts that work hard, take care of people, take care of our work, and also evaluate ourselves, look at ourselves. Uh, and at the same time, the parts that relax and have encourage us to have sweetness, relaxation, pleasure, novelty. So that's an a natural, that's a natural part of the human experience. And then the third part being our vulnerability, our shared humanity. We can all be emotionally hurt. You know, if a if a rock falls on my foot or your foot, we all our bodies will be in pain, our feet will be broken. We can all be emotionally hurt, very, very similarly. And it, we are hurt in the same and very sim you might be, feel it differently, but we are hurt by being ignored, by being exploited being not seen by being minimized. So the vulnerability. So what would happen with an addictive process if you're young, developmentally, you're young, you're growing up in a system, as they say, if your family is not able to protect you or nurture you, you will find worries to protect and nurture yourself. You'll develop strategies, strategies to be good and be seen in the world or strategies to soothe or distract or get out of the world. So that over time, we develop strategies that become sort of crystallized into an addictive process. Yeah. We're using something to get away to, to heal uh, <clears throat> attachment wounds and pain that we, we have no tools to take care of. And then we have other parts trying to get us back on track and just cycling. So that polarization develops over time, sort of like a battle between do it, don't do it, be good, be normal, and I have to get out of here. Uh, as someone might say, my, my, if I don't have firefighters, I can't shut my, main, my mind off. Right? I, I use it to, how else am I going to shut off my brain? And mm -hmm. what's in the brain? All that negative self-talk. So we would want to work with the parts that are soothing, but also the parts that are engaged in negative self-talk. We work directly with them. We have to do, that's for that healing the whole person. You know, you're interacting all the way around. You can't you can't just heal trauma and ignore behaviors either, right? I mean, it's not possible. Yeah. Okay. So let's see what else do we have here. Anybody else want to come and talk to us? Robert, where are you? Somebody here is saying Anka's oh. raised her hand. Hello, Anka. Come Hello. Down. Hello. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this open sharing. Um, a lot of stuff resonated with me, and this shared humanity was huge. <laughs> so mm. thank you. And um, yeah, there are a lot of parts in a body and I agree, they come if you give them space, and that's quite magic. 
Mm -hmm. I experienced that last year in Chen's course was focusing and it's still an ongoing process. Once you started that, it keeps going and that's just very beautiful. So thank you for the encouragement. I definitely will go and keep going. <laughs> beautiful. Tori. I am. Um, thank you for taking my, um, I guess my hand. <laughs> Um, I just was wondering, um, I work with a lot of clients that have limited amount of sessions between eight and 10. And so one of my parts certainly feels rushed sometimes that I don't have time to really work on that calming down. I mean, I really try to add it in. So I, I do sort of struggle with that. Uh, but I was wondering, I, I'm thinking of one person in particular and any thoughts, because um, again, it's limited sessions you know, a huge history of, um, you know, sexual abuse, eating disorders, um, and really sort of has a plan to um, end her life. Um, but she's in the midst of a, an incredible creative project. So I, and wants to finish that is kind of the, um, just a little snapshot of, of who she is. So we've just started working together, have my second session coming up next week. And again, I really love polyvagal theory and, and everything around calming the nervous system and, and actually rewiring our, our nervous system. But I have, um, again, it's that worry about how much time do I do I take? Because I sometimes when I have um, tried to slow things down and help people land and take in the room and what are you noticing and what's something that makes you feel safe in the room, that sometimes clients are rushed. And again, I know it's their parts. But I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts, you know, specifically on uh, the the case that I said and, and about that those parts that um, battle against slowing down to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to respond to that, Jan? I mean, I'm sure you have something to say about that, too. Yeah, but go for it. I, I'll, I'll just say that an IFS response to that, Tori. Uh, and it's a great question. I'm sure other people can relate to it. Not only the time limited, but the sense of the rush and the intensity and the urgency that clients bring to us. And then, you know, then we, what happens to us, we, in IFS language, we start to get blended with that sense of urgency and feel our over-responsible parts start getting very ramped up. Like, what can I do for them now? I've got 50 minutes. So we start feeling rushed and urgent and maybe self-critical about what are, are we using our time? Well, all of that stuff comes up. So I might say first is just really be gentle with ourselves um, and help our managers, if you will, uh, just relax and know that we want to mostly just meet that person. Having done that, what what I will in IFS, what I will be doing with this person is say, I just appreciate all your urgent parts. I'd be lay, I'd be laying out the parts. You just laid out a map for me right there, Tori. All her high functioning managers engaged in this project. Um, also, the urgent parts that say I have to get better now. She's feeling desperate. Then the other parts, I'm not sure if I heard exactly what her suit, she has suit, one of her firefighters is the part that wants to comfort her, if you will, by saying, I'll take you out. I'll take you out completely, a suicidal part or ideation. And then underneath all her vulnerabilities. So I would start out right away by starting to say, her, she's got a whole system going. So many of her parts are working so hard. And in IFS, we do regulation by saying, just, just pause for a minute. Just notice that part that's so urgent. See if you can get a, just an inch of space from it. You know, what does a fable happen if it's not so urgent? Well, then, you know, I'll, I'll have collapse. Right. There are parts that have collapsed in the past. So just building that empathy toward ourselves and, and bit by bit, that's how we might regulate just right in the beginning of a session, looking at a pattern, not a, not a part or one piece of someone, but their whole system and beginning to in, right away internally focus. It's beautiful. Yeah. And also just remembering that the most important thing, especially in working with addiction, right, is to create a relationship where a person can begin to experience being present with you and themselves. Even if it's a little tiny bit, it's really the, the basis of the work is that they can come into being present with themselves, which means they need, you need to make that relationship where they feel safe enough to do that with you 
even if it's a short little period of time throughout the session. But that's the beginning of wanting something more, right? Mm -hmm. Wanting something more to come out of. I remember years ago, Bessel, going to see Bessel talk, Vanderkop, and him saying, you know, you can't just, a person who's really feeling traumatized feels caught in a trap at the back of the cage. You know, like how animals do when you take them, your pet to the vet and they hide at the back of the cage. It's like you you have to, you can't just stand at the door and say, gee, it's really nice out here. You have to reach in. Yeah. This is the leading, right? right? You have to reach in in a very careful, gentle, respectful way and coax. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. To to come a little bit closer. And that connection that you make, like, can you feel it with Cease? There's just this way that you would begin to feel safe with her, right? And want to come out because there is a part of you that brought you to that session, to her office. You got and that it. part of you is the inner self helper. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love what you're saying, which is that sense of nothing happens in a fraud environment. Yeah. anxiety does not does not heal anxiety <laughs> yeah heart does not heal part so i yeah. love what you're saying to you yeah. and polyvagal terms we would say you need to start looking towards some kind of ventral energy for healing because mm -hmm. healing doesn't happen in sympathetic or dorsal states mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay uh oh santa hello santa Oh, my, hi. <laughs> um, yeah, I um, did some workshops with uh, Dick. I think it was the 80s or I mean, before he was a name, I did a week long with him. And um, well, I did some workshops with him in in uh, Northern California and uh, then a week long at Asalon. And um, oh, yes, he's wet. Uh, yes, right. Oh, my God. I really, I've never worked with him um, personally, but at that point, it was like I bowed down. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's like, he's like um, a shaman in <laughs> therapist clothes or something like that. But it was, it was really unique because I, I got to see how. Um, just how he worked, how other people worked with him. And it was just beyond, beyond the pale. It was just, uh, what the work he did. Okay. What am I saying? So, um, then, um, but I was, so when you, when now, you know, with the trauma, uh, informed trainings and everything is about the body. At one point I took, a a weekend with um Susan O'Connell who oh yeah doing uh somatic IFS and uh -huh. I I don't know what's really happened with her but um you know how IFS is bringing in uh the body might be a question and as you were talking about you know, the seventies and the feminism and all the stuff with women's bodies. It's like, it's so complicated. It's so thick culturally women's bodies, you know, that, I mean, I've been sort of on the path all my life of that. And still there's this conditioning that doesn't, doesn't budge. So I just wanted to make that comment. It's not so easy as just, oh, own your body or whatever. It's just um, a lot of things have had to take place before before that in a way, and it's still ongoing. Uh, but I wondered how I IFS now is addressing, I know, I know Dick worked with um, eating disorders and stuff, but... Um, and he came into his own with the whole trauma thing. All of a sudden, everybody wants his trainings, you know. Um, but I'm just wondering, is there a, a, a different way of working with addiction? Or is it just the same thing, mapping out the parts and working with the protectors and bringing up the exiles and the whole thing? 
Uh, well, you're saying a lot there, Santa. I mean, think I might. <laughs> yeah. But briefly, even the parts we would say around, around IFS, the parts of us that have been adopted, the cultural conditioning about our bodies or about women's bodies, other parts of us haven't adopted it. So in IFS, we'd even call that parts. That legacy we, is still held by parts of us, just as other parts of us resist the legacy, right? Some buy in, some don't. So in IFS, we'd even look at that as parts that have adopted or adapted into that legacy and other parts that don't. So <clears throat> to just to look at it that way, so to add oh. that piece to it. And around addictive processes, its core is still the model. You know, we divide it into uh, three parts and we work with self. But I think that some specific adaptations, which are in my book that I can't what came out in 2023. Oh, um, can you, Rashawn, will you put a link to Cece's book in there? Oh, yeah, thanks. Okay. thanks yeah. Jane. yeah. Um, so there are some more specific interventions that we would do specifically around systems where the firefighters have kind of taken control of the of the of the uh, of the body, mind, and spirit, and how we can work with that in IFS. And it is using essentially the same pieces of inviting self and listening, but it also is, there's a very specific ways we might reassure fears. There's massive manager fear that is also culturally informed about what addicts mean. I even think about treatment centers, right? I mean, many treatment centers do amazing jobs. This is not a bashing of treatment centers, but so often they're divided up. Here's our trauma unit. Here's our eating disorder unit, and here's our um, substance use unit. And I think, really? And I've known people who come out and they say things like, they'll use it as a defense to their family. Well, I was in the trauma unit, so I don't really have a substance use issue, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, whoa. <laughs> so, you know, uh, <laughs> but again, that's also because stigma, because substance use right. means a bad thing. And trauma is something that, you know, I don't have, to, I can just own it. So in IFS, we kind of pull all of this together and we know that there are parts that are carry the trauma, that there are massive fear, judgment and inner stigma, inner. We have all internalized stigma and assumptions around the parts that engage in using. We have, unless we work with our parts, we've absorbed the idea that we must control that. I think it's universal. Everyone can imagine and know of a time in your life you tried to change one a behavior or a practice you have and you failed. <laughs> you don't eat less, drink less, watch less TV, uh, put fewer things in the shopping part, cart. You know, you're noticing that pattern. And so in IFS, very specifically, we work with all the fears of the controllers, their, their fear of stepping back. And sort of when they sort of learn and trust self, the self energy or the ass, the ability to regulate, right? And they then regulate and be in leadership, inner leadership. The self engages in inner leadership. I'm the leader on the outside. On the inside, the part, the self says, okay, step back, manager. If you've heard, I hear your fears. Can you step back? Manager says, I'll step back for five minutes. <laughs> Watch me talk to the firefighter. Those parts are way more complex than they seem. They look like they're crazy and chaotic, but asking them, what are you afraid will happen if you don't take me out? You'll fall apart. You'll have too much pain. You'll have no voice, you'll have no autonomy, all of those fears. So specifically with addictive processes, there are specific fears that are related to that change that we listen to really closely. Thank you. All right. So Neil, Neil, are you here? Do you want to chat or do you want me to read out? I don't see you here. Okay, Neil says, isn't there a danger of over compartmentalizing parts for the patient? In other words, inadvertently holding them in a bit too cognitive centric way, rather than allowing a greater fluidity, which can be titrated through deepening sense of safety, through more slowly deepening affect co-regulation. Mm. Uh, yeah, it could go that way. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. <laughs> uh, you know, but it would, I think if I were to hear, I, I love that sense of it. And without trying IFS and you're listening to the concepts, it does sound sort of very heady and head based. But again, <clears throat> we often are asking our clients to listen to their own activation, to follow their activation, to finding parts in and around the body. 
that we are engaged in deregulating when we unblend and separate from a particular kind of energy or process inside. So, but if someone were to stay just in their head, it would be like that. And that would be, uh, that wouldn't be very helpful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in a very pragmatic way, how in IFS, in your way of working, mm. how would you help somebody manage um, drinking too much alcohol in the really just the day to day of that? Right. Well, there's a couple of ways, which is I might just say, what is something that you want to change? You know, so first I'm going to recognize the parts that are ready to change and the parts that are not. Mm -hmm. So I want to welcome that. <clears throat> so in other words, to have, I'd like to have self make a decision rather than a part. Yeah. And see how so, important that is, right? That's right. Really important because you're opening up and acknowledging mm -hmm. instead of getting into a power struggle internally. Yes. Yes. Acknowledging that there all are, are all these different ways of being and thinking and feeling about what's going on inside. That's right. So when someone says I need to change my drinking and I and they come in with that urgent sense, right? I start with that urgent part, honoring it, listening mm -hmm. to it, acknowledging its fears, and then I'm blending them from it or regulating with them around that. Uh, and then sort of listening to the parts that are afraid to stop drinking. And what are they afraid will happen? So at the beginning of most sessions, we may have to do a little of that. We often do a little of that. That mm -hmm. gets sort of shorter as the work goes on. You know, the client sort of can unblend a little bit. But then we would have some action steps. What is something that you're willing to do this week? You know, mm -hmm. I'm drinking less or I drink more, less uh, or drink shorter amounts or change what I'm drinking or make some kind of decision around that. So it's sort of similar to a harm reduction. Yeah, and so you might say, what parts of you don't want to do that? Yeah. What parts of you might object? Where? So rather than uh, what is my trigger, um, it's sort of like, what is my pattern? So they might also be looking that I know my pattern is after everyone's gone to bed. That's yeah. when I start eating and drinking, eating, drinking, watching TV. So looking at that and they might say, what can I do instead or how? So they may make a plan. Yeah. And then no shame, come back next week. Let's see how that's happening. What does that look like? Yeah. But it's so much about, I can't just create a behavior. I'm never working with one behavior in a session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because particularly in addiction, there's lots of different contrary uh, parts going on there. That's and right. what, what then when we bring in polyvagal theory, we can say, you know, what noticing the state in the body that that's in, like right. say state and then how to really bring that bodily response on board so we're working in both of those ways right parts and then mm -hmm. oh, that's beautiful yeah we use harm reduction too for sure mm -hmm. which includes sobriety it's of course like it includes sobriety if that's what a person's whole being and body is ready for right Absolutely. So many people are like, I want to be done with this. And it feels very core in their system. I want to be done. Yeah. So this is not about, as someone said, so if we do IFS, everyone in the whole world can drink alcohol responsibly. I say, no, everyone in the whole world can know who they are and make self-led decisions, <laughs> you know, and that will be the, and for many people, they're very, very happy to no longer be using substances. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Emily, we have, yeah, we have time for one more. Hello, Emily. Yeah. I'll try to make this brief because it's pretty IFS specific, but I'm wondering if you can just talk for a moment about kind of unburdening exiles and the limits of that when you don't have the formal IFS training. I've been trying to get into level one. I'm sure many people have. And I know that there's a lot of like risk at least from what i've heard to going forward with unburdening parts or sorry exiles so i haven't done that with any of my clients although i'm feeling it would be really helpful so i'm really i'm just curious about kind of the limitations of that and how you would kind of go about working with exiles and the limitations of that without having sure. the formal training uh -huh. Well, first, I just appreciate your thoughtfulness and your care for your clients, even in asking the question, Emily. And the next piece about it is, 
if you can't get into a training, if you can get into an IFS therapist, if you can, uh, I highly recommend that uh, as a way. So if you've experienced uh, the sense of witnessing and being with your own exiles and you've experienced what an unburdening might feel like, it, that's another way to learn and a really powerful way to learn. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to advise you exactly around your clients about what you can and cannot do. Um, but what you're watching for in that relationship when you're connecting, someone's connecting to a part, holding old memories or hold old burden beliefs, what you're listening for all the time is are they in self towards that or as Jim might say, in fully regulated or are there other, is sympathetic coming in or are there other parts come in that are getting urgent or rescuey? So I'm listening very carefully to a self to part relationship. Um, and watching for other for dysregulation or other parts to come in and dealing with that. So I want to really go slow. Um, <clears throat> in um, you know my is it my grandmother's hands that book um, Rensma Manaka. He says trauma happens fast. We want to go slow. So to really go slow in connection. No one wants to relive their childhood, but they do want to connect and learn the meaning. So the other piece that you're having before you unburden a part is. When you went through this thing with your family, this thing with your brother, this thing, this time when your father left the house, what was the meaning of that for you? What did you take on as in a sense of identity about yourself after that? I'm no good. No, it is coming. So sometimes just listening for the meaning of those events can be really, really powerful and healing. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thanks for the question. One more. Do, could you have time, Cease? Yes, yeah, sure. How do you deal with highly narrative parts that do not let you in, protecting the person from changing, like they overtalk any attempt to go inside? Yeah, that's a big one, isn't it, Shannon, in our work? I just would love to tell you my story. I think you got to do, with my clients, I always do a both and. On the one hand, I want to hear everything you have to say, and I want to hear your whole life, and I want to hear what happened with your sister this week. And, <laughs> and... <laughs> We're going to pause, breathe, notice for a moment. So I might say, let me just pause you for just a moment after a few minutes, a handful of minutes. Say, let's pause for a minute. Let's take a breath together. You know, just slow them down and say, what does it feel like to tell me that? What's coming up for you as you talk about this issue? Ah, and then we start to identify. You're starting to feel anxious or actually you're starting to feel a little calm or, oh, you know what? I guess I feel sad or I feel lonely. So we begin the process. We may not go inside in that moment, but we start identifying the other parts. They may feel like they need to go back to tell me more of the story. I totally get that. I've been a client. There's a lot I want to say. <laughs> I relate. But at the same time, I want to be with them. I want to do that both and. So I really think being respectful of their need to talk, as I like to say, you might be the healthiest person they know, however you want to take that. <laughs> they don't have anyone to talk to. There is no one attuning. So just that relationship attunement is really powerful. But you know when it's they're getting in their own way. So I, 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 I'm really in that leadership that you're talking about, Jan, and I'd say, you know what, if we, I want to hear you, and yet the parts that keep telling me the story in a way are protecting us from doing something that I think will actually help us work with the story in a different way. Yeah. So we still have to identify those as parts of the system. They're trying to protect, but at the same time, their impact is not what they intend. Yeah. And there's a beautiful way in which we can come to an end and, and talk about the blending of these models that, you know, in FSPM, felt sense polyvagal model, we're really looking at process, right? So when Cease talks about, you know, Let's notice what's happening here in the process. You know, so we slow it down and say, maybe it's really scary to move from the story into just feeling into something in the moment. And that's completely understandable. Let's just notice it. Yeah. Perfect. I Perfect, we put. <laughs> I really enjoyed this. I feel like we could be friends. We could talk. Oh, it would be so fun, Jen. Thank you so much for inviting me into oh, your community, you. your lovely community. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. And we share a lot. So check out yes. Susan. Hope you buy her book. And next time we have Raja Selvam coming, who uh, has developed um, a lot of research and a model in the role of emotion in working with embodiment and really bringing an embodiment into how we work with feelings. So I'm looking forward to that. And that's in April. And then in May, 
uh, Rashawn, I think we have uh, Ariel Schwartz coming back. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Ariel, do you know Ariel Cease? I don't know her personally. No, She's so, such a lovely person, an incredible mega mind. Mm. Uh, person. And uh, she just wrote a wonderful book that I have right here. Just came out actually on doorstep. Applied polyvagal theory in yoga. So therapeutic practice right. for emotional health. It's an amazing book. Um, yeah, so she's coming back in May to be with us. So Beautiful. thank you, everyone. And thank you so much, Cease, for coming to be with us. Thank and you. So I'm going to read your book, and I'm gonna, then I'm going to email you. <laughs> All right, perfect. I'm going to read. You do the same. You got a new one out, too. <laughs> yeah, I have a new one. I just handed it in to Norton. I have minor edits, if you can believe it. Oh, that's heaven. Yay. <laughs> yeah. So it's 20 embodied practices that take you through the felt sense polyvagal model. And then we'll start leading groups again in trauma and addiction. But these groups will be for trauma and addiction, not just addiction groups or just trauma groups. As Cease was saying, you bring it together. We're all the same people, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone is welcome. Mm, it's just really lovely to hear you speak, Jan. I just love it. It's very resonant to my system. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, Thank for coming. You. Thanks, yeah. everybody. See you next Thanks time. Thanks for the time and attention. Take care now. Thanks and be well. Bye-bye. Bye for now.